Hey, welcome to A Foreigner in the Philippines. I'm looking at my books again, and uh, here I am looking at uh, the stories. Uh, this is a book called The the Complete Stories of Truman Capote. Uh, uh, it's really uh, brilliant stuff. On the front by the magazine Newsday, it says, of this book, it says, An Abundance of Riches. It is not hard at all to open to any page and be amused, moved, intrigued. Well, that, that's what I say a great writer is always like that. That even if you've read his stories, you can look back at any page, open any page, and, and you will find a page of treasure. And, and that's what, it's an abundance of riches, and that's what this book is as well. And I was reading... Uh, I hadn't really read, read that many. I've read two or three of the books, uh, of the stories that he's read. And, and I was so impressed and I was so delighted when I got this book. This book was sent to me, um, The Complete Stories of Truma Capote. I was so delighted because it has, it has in here The Shape of Things, which is a story that I am going to read at some point uh, when I want to devote... The entire story but there's so many others and uh, and they're so funny and I have thought of him mainly as a funny writer but uh, that's in my ignorance and then I found this book and uh, it really is great this is a, a, a story called the master misery master misery and master misery was someone who who used to buy people's dreams. It's a very whimsical story. He used to buy whimsical dreams. And the young woman, who is quite a, a lost soul, is Sarah. And, and she begins to earn a few dollars because the man for a really excellent dream, and they had to be, tr uh, had to be true, and he had an instinct for them. So... It was, it was when he met, when she met him, that she also met this man who she describes as a clown, O'Reilly, and he fits, he fits the perfect description of an Irishman who has learned to drink too much. Heavens, Irishmen are not like that usually, but O'Reilly, he's. He's sitting with her and, and she begins, she meets him when he's causing a real, a real fuss at the house of, uh, of Mr. Revan. Let me see what, oh, I've forgotten the man's name, but the Master Misery, the dream buyer. And she meets him there and he makes a lot of trouble, but she sees him when she goes out and they become <laughs> kind of the odd couple and and she learns to spend a lot of time with him, just talking. And they would, uh, they would really be the odd couple because he would be the Irish drunk, and and she would be the young innocent girl. So she's sitting in this place with him, this cheap cafe, and he's smoking, and it's smarting her eyes, and it intensifies her frown. So I'll read from there. If only I knew what he wanted with those dreams. This is a master misery. All typed and filed. What does he do with them? You're right when you say he is master mystery. Misery. He can't simply be some silly quack. It can't be so meaningless as that. But why does he want dreams? Help me. O'Reilly, think, think. What does it mean? Squinting one eye, O'Reilly poured himself another drink. The clown-like twist of his mouth hardened into a line of scholarly straightness. That is a million dollar question, kid. Why don't you ask me something easy, like how to cure the common cold? Yes, kid, what does it mean? So, I'm going to skip on the next. Now, Master Misery, maybe he hasn't got a soul. Maybe bit by bit he borrows yours, steals it like he would steal your dollars or the chicken wing off your plate. Hundreds of souls have passed through him and gone into a filing case. O'Reilly 
be serious, she said again, annoyed because she thought he was making jokes. And then she sees that his uh, expression has changed. He was looking towards the entrance of the cafe. Three men were there, two policemen and a civilian, a civilian wearing a clerk's cloth jacket. The clerk was pointing towards their table. O'Reilly's eyes circled the room with trapped despair. He sighed then and leaned back in his seat, ostentatiously pouring himself another drink. Good evening, gentlemen, he said, when the officer, official party confronted him. Will you join us for a drink? You can't arrest him, cried Sylvia. You can't arrest a clown. She threw her $10 bill at them, but the policeman did not pay any attention and she began to pound the table. All the customers in the place were staring and the manager came running up, wringing his hands. The police said for O'Reilly to get to his feet. Certainly, O'Reilly said. Though I do think it's shocking you have to trouble yourself with such petty crimes as mine when everywhere there are master thieves afoot. For instance, this pretty child. He stepped between the officers and pointed to Sylvia. She is the recent victim of a major theft. Poor baby. She has had her soul stolen. For two days that followed, O'Reilly's arrest. Sylvia did not leave her room. Sun on the window, then dark. By the third day she had run out of cigarettes, so she ventured out as far as the corner delicatessen. She bought a packet of cupcakes, a can of sardines, a newspaper and cigarettes. In all this time she had not eaten, and it was a light, delicious, sharpening sensation. But the climb back up the stairs, the relief of closing the door, those so exhausted her that she could not quite make the daybed. <laughs> she slid down to the floor and did not move until it was day again. She thought afterwards that she'd been there about 20 minutes. Turning on the radio as loud as it would go, she dragged a chair up to the window and opened the newspaper on her lap. Lena Denis. Lena denies. Russia rejects. Miners conciliate. Of all the things, this was saddest that life had gone by. Even one's leaves one's lover, life should. If one leaves one's lover, life should stop for him. And if one disappears from the world, then the world should stop too. And it never did. And that was the real reason for most people getting up in the morning. Not because it would matter, but because it wouldn't. But if Mr. Revercombe, the master misery, succumbed or succeeded finally in collecting all the dreams out of every head, perhaps the idea slipped, became entangled with radio and newspaper, falling temperatures, a snowstorm moving across Colorado, across the west, falling upon all the small towns, yellowing every light, filling every footfall, falling now and here, but how quickly it had come. The snowstorms, the roofs, the vacant lot, the distant, the distant deep in white and deepening like sleep. She looked at the paper and she looked at the snow, but it must have been snowing all day. It could not have just started. There was no sound of traffic in the swirling wastes of the vacant lot children circled the bonfire. A car, buried at the curb, winked its headlights. Help! Help! Silent, like the heart's distress. She crumbled a cupcake and sprinkled it on the window sill. North birds would come to keep her company, and she left the window open for them. Snow, wind, scattered flakes that dissolved on the floor like April Fool jewels. Present life can be beautiful. Turn that radio down. The Witch of the Woods was tapping at her door. Yes, is, yes, Mrs. Halloran, she said, and turned off the radio altogether. Snow, quiet, sleep, silent. Only the fun, faraway song singing of children. And the room was blurred 
blue with cold, colder than the cold of fairy tales. Lie down, my heart, among the igloo flowers of snow. Mr. Revacom, mystery, master of misery, why do you wait upon the threshold? Ah, do come inside. It is so cold out there. But her moment of waking was warm and held. The window was closed and a man's arms were around her. He was singing to her, his voice gentle but jaunty. Cherry berry, money berry, happy berry pie. But the best old pie is love berry pie. O'Reilly, is it... is it really you? He squeezed her. Baby's awake now. And how does she feel? I had thought I was dead, she said and happiness winged around inside her like a bird lamed but still flying. She tried to hug him, but she was too weak. I love you, O'Reilly. You are my only friend, and I was so frightened. I thought I would never see you again. She paused, remembering. But why aren't you in jail? O'Reilly's face got all tickled and pink. I was never in jail, he said mysteriously. But first, let's have something to eat. I brought some things from the delicatessen this morning. She had a sudden feeling of floating. How long have you been here? Since yesterday, he said, fussing around with bundles and paper plates. You let me in yourself. That's impossible. I don't remember it at all. I know, he said, leaving it at that. Here, drink your milk like a good kid and I'll tell you a real wicked story. O'Reilly stayed with her in the room over the weekend. It was like the most beautiful party Sylvie could remember. She'd never left so much for one thing and no one, certainly no one in her family, had ever made her feel so loved. O'Reilly was a fine cook and he fixed delicious dishes on the little electric stove. Once he scooped snow off the window sill and made sherbet flayed with strawberry syrup. By Sunday she was strong enough to dance. He turned on the radio and she danced until she fell to her knees, windless and laughing. I'll never be afraid again, she said. I hardly know why I was afraid of what I was afraid of to begin with. The same things you'll be afraid of the next time, O'Reilly told her quietly. That is the quality of Master Misery. No one ever knows what he is, not even children. And they know more, mostly everything. Sylvia went to the window. An arctic whiteness lay over the city, but the snow had stopped, and the night sky was clear as ice. There, riding above the river, she saw the first star of evening. I see the first star, she said, crossing her fingers. And um, what do you wish when you see the first star? I wish to see another star, she said. At least... That is what I usually wish. But tonight? She sat down on the floor and leaned her head against his knee. Tonight, I wish that I could have back all my dreams. Don't we all? O'Reilly said, stroking her hair. But then, what would you do? I mean... What would you do if you could have them back? Sylvia was st si silent for a moment. When, when she spoke, her eyes were gravely distant. I would go home, she said slowly. And that is a terrible decision. For it would mean giving up most of my other dreams. But if Mr. Revercombe would let me have them back, then I would go home tomorrow. 
Saying nothing, O'Reilly went to the closet and brought back her coat. But why? she asked as he helped her on with it. Never mind. Just do as I tell you. We're going to pay Mr. Revacombe a call and you're going to ask him to give you back your dreams. It's a chance. Sylvia balked at the door. Please, O'Reilly, don't make me go. I can't. Please, I'm afraid. I thought you said you'd never be afraid again. But once in the street, he hurried her so quickly against the wind she did not have time to be frightened. It was Sunday. Stores were closed and the traffic lights seemed to wink only for them, for there were no moving cars along the snow-deep avenue. Sylvia even forgot where they were going and chattered of trivial oddments. Right here at this corner is where she'd seen Garbo, and over there that is where the old woman was run over. Presently, however, she stopped, out of breath and overwhelmed with sudden realisation. I can't, O'Reilly, she said, pulling back. What can I say to him? Make it like a business deal, said O'Reilly. Tell him straight out that you want your dreams, and if he'll give them to you, you'll pay back all the money on the instalment plan. Naturally, it's simple enough, kid. Why the hell couldn't he give them back? They are all right there in a filing cabinet. This speech was somehow convincing and stamping her frozen feet, Sylvia went ahead with a certain courage. That's the kid, he said. They separated on 3rd Avenue. O'Reilly being of the opinion that Mr. Revercombe's immediate neighbourhood was not for the moment precisely safe. He confined himself in a dory, now and then lighting a match and singing aloud. But the best old pie is a whiskey berry pie. Like a wolf, a long, thin dog came padding over the moon slats under the elevated, and across the street there were the misty shapes of men ganged around a bar. The idea of maybe cadging a drink in there made him groggy. Just as he had decided on perhaps trying something of the sort, Sylvia appeared and she was in his arms before he knew that it was really her. It can't be so bad, sweetheart, he said softly, holding her as best he could. Don't cry, baby. It's too cold to cry. You'll chap your face. As she strangled for words, her crying evolved into a tremulous, unnatural laugh. The air was filled with the smoke of her laughter. Do you know what he said? She gasped. Do you know what he said when I asked for my dreams? Her head fell back and her laughter rose and carried over the street like an abandoned, wildly coloured kite. O'Reilly had finally to shake her by the shoulders. He said, I couldn't have them back because, because he'd used them all up. She was silent then, her face smoothing into an expressionless calm. She put her arm through O'Reilly's and together they moved down the street, but it was as if they were friends pacing a platform, each waiting for the other's train. And when they reached the corner, he cleared his throat and said, I guess I'd better turn off here. It's as likely a spot as any. Sylvia held on to his sleeve. But where will you go, O'Reilly? I'll be travelling in the blue, he said, trying a smile that didn't work out very well. She opened her purse. A man cannot travel in the blue without a bottle, she said, and kissing him on the cheek, slipped five dollars in his pocket. Bless you, babe. It did not matter that it was the last of her money that now she would have to walk home and alone. The pilings of snow were like the white waves of a white sea. 
and she rode upon them, carried by winds and tides of the moon. I do not know what I want, and perhaps I shall never know, but my only wish from every star will always be another star. And truly, I am not afraid, she thought. Two boys came out of a bar and stared at her. In some park some long time ago she had seen these two boys and they might be the same. Truly, I am not afraid, she thought, hearing their snowy footsteps following after her. And anyway, there was nothing to steal. Nothing left to steal. I thought the last part was really beautiful. About two unlikely people finding joy and hope just by being together. So that's a book. The Complete Stories of Truman Capote. Now my measure my measure of a good book, and let's face it, what is good for one is not always good for another. But my measure is when you become so focused on what the author has said that the words no longer get in the way. Isn't there a song like that? I wanted to talk to you, but the words got in the way. And with this particular story, it reached my my gold standard view and that is when you're reading and you are so taken by the story that you are unaware of the words and the room around you disappears that's uh, that's the way this one was for me this is a foreigner in the Philippines. Thanks for listening and bye for now.